Most pre-meds today take zero gap years between college and medical school. In 2019, 32.1% of matriculants were aged between 20 and 22. These are likely your zero gap year students. In 2023, that number is down almost 5% to 27.4%. The majority of pre-meds are now taking some time off after college. Today, medical school rates are in the 40s and more pre-meds are taking some time to increase their competitiveness. Combine these facts and it's not a stretch to say that getting into medical school today is a bit harder than when Grand Uncle Steve applied in 1960 when the acceptance rate was 60%. This student from UCLA in California, classified as overrepresented in medicine, successfully gets into a top 50 US medical school without taking a gap year, without having perfect stats. And if you want to get into medical school without taking more time off, you'll want to see the end of the video where I show you how most pre-meds think about research and extracurricular activities and how this successful pre-med positioned himself perfectly for his dream opportunities. All right, another day, another application breakdown. Today we have a application with a 3.7 GPA, 512 MCAT score, no gap year was able to get into a fantastic top 50 U.S. medical school. Um, this application is different from our 4.0, 523 other application breakdowns. This is an application that has been requested by many viewers um, just because sometimes the sky high stats can be a little bit unrelatable. And so we'll get a sense of what this application looks like uh, with these types of stats, but altogether still a fantastic set of extracurricular activities and, set of, uh, and a set of fantastic um, experiences that he discusses in his application with a fantastic outcome with his top 50 medical school acceptance with no gap year. So this was all done in three years. A minus average, uh, this is a overrepresented majority or uh, not majority overrepresented um, ethnicity in medicine and let's go ahead and go ahead and swing straight to the conclusions here so conclusion number one this is these are the things that I want you to take away from this application breakdown first and foremost let's You'll see many examples of him inviting the reader into his world. It's raw, it's uncut, it's removed from all your own preconceived notions. And I have these orange asterisks here uh, to show you how he does that in some of his experiences. Two, you, your story, and your personality is all we ever really want to know about in this written application. This is its point. It's you, not your publications or your volunteer work. Those show parts of you, and we really want to get the whole holistic understanding of who you are as a person, the person behind the written application. We have some examples here to go over. You'll get, after you start seeing these examples, you really start to see, and, and maybe you'll have the same feeling that I did, which is, man, I really want to see this guy succeed. I really want to root for this guy. He seems like a very genuine, trustworthy, authentic guy. Um, and I hope and wish for him the best. And I think you'll feel the same way when you start reading some of his personality come through the writing. Lastly, I want you to think actively about how you want to come across, right? What energy do you want to give your readers? Uh, what, what do you want them to leave with and bring back to the admissions committees that they talk to? I want you to actively write these down. Like, I want to come across as authentic. I want to come across as straightforward. I want to come across as friendly. I want to come across as approachable, right? Those are some of the words that might describe me. And you might have other words that describe how you want to come across. But writing them down just to put your money down and put your foot down and say, this is how I want it to feel. And then comparing that one, two, three words or values with how your writing actually sounds and actually feels, that is a very powerful exercise that I encourage every uh, applicant to do. It's actually one that we have our students do as well. Number three, completing, competing in your own lane automatically makes you world-class. I can't have the highest GPA in the world. I also cannot have the highest MCAT in the world. There's too many people that compete in those spheres. 
right? And this is what most pre-meds do. You'll see that you'll, I have this army of 20 or 30 pre-meds here. Let me make this smaller so you can enjoy the, the art that I have here. But you'll have uh, these rows of pre-meds, 30 pre-meds who are applying to the publicly available research. And I literally Googled uh, UCLA Research Center, and these are the things that came up as being available. There's a project on aquatic crop cultivation. There's a project on epigenetics and stem cells, a project on skin cancer immunotherapy, and then a project on RNA viruses and breakdown. Uh, and all these pre-meds, regardless of what they're interested in, they might be interested in cardiology or community service or Spanish language and arts or uh, diseases specific to the French, um, but they will all apply for these four all-encompassing activities that everyone has access to because they're publicly available and there's public job listings. And then when all of them get rejected, they'll say, why can't I get research? It's impossible. I go to a very competitive public school and there's no way I can be a doctor because there's not enough research opportunities for me and I give up. And I get that feeling. I felt the same way when I was in your shoes. This applicant takes a different and a much more refreshing approach. He also sees these opportunities. He goes, aquatic crop cultivation? Mm, nah, that's, that doesn't really resonate. Epigenetics and stem cells? No, it doesn't really re resonate. RNA virus? No, nah, skin cancer? Cool, but I, I don't really resonate with it. So I'm not going to apply. He thinks about them, but doesn't apply, right? And these are all the publicly available ones. And he looks at his interests that you'll see in this application breakdown. You see football. You see the homeless. You see concussions. You see EMT. You see children. And then he ends up doing research that is never publicly available, but privately he seeks out faculty members that are in line with his interests. And he finds this faculty member that measures head impacts and concussions using MRI and head ultrasounds to track brain activation over time in division one football players in high school athletes. Not public, publicly available, but is a perfect fit for someone who used to be a high school football player, who's the equipment manager now at his Division One college, who is interested in emergency medicine and head trauma and concussions. You can see how this experience, albeit privately available, is such a perfect fit for him that I don't care if all of these pre-meds have 4.0s and 528s. Their interests are not so uniquely dialed in that they would be a better fit for this experience than this applicant is. And this is why this applicant gets this experience and excels in it. And this is why he does, he, he astutely says no to these other experiences that are not a good fit for him because he can't compete. How is he gonna compete with other people applying for aquatic crop cultivation if his interests are football, EMT, and concussions? It doesn't make sense. Right. And so I just love how this application demonstrates how you can be world class in anything. And the easiest way to become world class is to identify what it is that you're interested in and uh, compete there, compete in your own lane. And we'll show examples of this. But those are the three big things that I want this application breakdown to teach. So let's go ahead and walk down some of these asterisks. Conclusion number one, inviting the reader into the world. Let's see some of these orange asterisks here. All right, so maybe they're stars. Here we go. So we'll start with this emergency medical technician ambulance uh, experience here. Last summer, I trained for two months, and let's zoom this back in. There we go, that'll work. Last summer, I trained for two months at UCLA's Center for Pre-Hospital Care to become an EMT. I learned how to stabilize and transport patients. After my classroom training is complete, I started working for a private company where the training continues. I am learning to be prompt without rushing, to speak clearly but softly, and to show respect and kindness at all times. I'm just gonna pause here. He seems like so, like he's like a, a community humble servant, right? Like he's very deferential in his writing. I, I am learning to be prompt without rushing, to speak clearly and put my, my points across, but softly and to show respect and kindness at all times. You're starting to really see this like very soft, genuine, caring, deferential side to him, even in this one sentence. That's what really stood out to me there. 
the most important thing that I needed to learn was how to remain control of my emotions. Again, this is a guy that's just like really looking to work on himself. As a new EMT, I was assigned to interfacility transport. I'll never forget one patient that I was transferring to hospice facility. After her family made the decision to stop chemotherapy, she was extremely weak. Her cancer, together with her treatment, took a terrible toll on her, and it was painfully easy to lift her em emaciated body, emaciated body onto the gurney. Like, wow. This detail is so specific that it, it like actually gives me goosebumps. Like the thought of lifting this very thin old lady whose chemotherapy has been stopped, she has progressive cancer, she's going to hospice, she's probably 70, 60 pounds. This detail and the phrase painfully easy just really hits home, right? I wrote here, no one else felt this weight. The details erase generic writing and it just really invites you to this scene, right? You got the blaring red and blue lights on the ambulance. You got two grown, young, strong men and women working with the EMT, picking up this very frail woman onto her world, onto her uh, ride to the hospice facility. The patient needed oxygen and was in a lot of pain, right? Even more details, it just hurt. It just hurts, despite having been administered pain medication. Her younger sister rode in the back of the ambulance and I wanted to keep the sister talking because I knew it would comfort my patient to hear her sister's voice. We spoke about my patient's life and about her pastimes. I held her hand. Like this is just four words that just really pull at the heartstrings, right? You get this woman, she's close, close to the end of her life and you have this young man who just became a certified EMT. I held her hand. When we dropped her off at the hospice facility, she smiled at me and whispered, thank you. Whispered, right, because she's old and frail. For several days after that trip, my thoughts returned to that patient and her family's suffering, conjuring very intense emotions that were difficult to cope with. Like, this sucks. Now you're starting to feel for the guy. Over time, experiences like that have led me to greatly mature as a person. After a lot of reflection and talking with my mentors, I understand that empathy and compassion are the root of medicine, and my emotional well-being and ability to self-care are vital to preserve my effectiveness as a medical provider. Right? This is a cliche. Emotional well-being and ability to self-care are vital to preserve my effectiveness as a medical provider, but cliches are okay when they're supported. Right? He tells this terrible story of a young i mean of a old frail lady whose chemo has failed and is going to hospice is in terrible pain needs oxygen short of breath has air hunger and he understands from her the value of empathy and compassion holding her hand having those thoughts return to her patient his patient and her family's suffering right this really lands because of that story i have learned that no matter what situation i'm faced with i'm striving to do my absolute best helps achieve a sense of peace and purpose. I wrote here that this successfully invites the reader to his inner world, his conflicting emotions, right? It, it just hurts to read that this guy was lifting a frail, dying woman onto the gurney, holding her hand, dropping her off and thinking about her and how badly she and her family must be hurting. I feel like I am in the ambulance in the back putting oxygen on this patient, listening to her sister speak about her life. The details erase generic and mediocre writing. And I think this is just a fantastic example of that. Another thing I noted here is, uh, he writes this again, though, where the training continues to be prompt without rushing, speak clearly but softly, show respect and kindness at all times. You can start to see his personality come through, right? He's serious, but he's soft. He's trained but he's still learning, right? He's a certified EMT, but the training continues, right? You, you start to really almost become a fan of this guy, at least with that first experience. That's how I felt, and maybe you feel the same way. Okay, next we have um, this Plato Society, where I think this these asterisks are for that extracurricular, so I'm gonna skip that one. Here we go, we have another two orange stars here, chess. When I was 10 years old, my grandpa taught me how to play chess, to understand each piece, or each permutation, and how to pick the right move. 
We played dozens of games over the years, and he would toy with me, grant me a handicap by removing his queen from the board or giving himself mere seconds to make his moves, right? These details are just so inviting. The queen, I take out the queen, there's grandpa just giving me a handicap again, and the, and the young chess athlete against an aged grandpa uh, moving after seconds, the, sec the grandpa really pushing himself, I move, I move, I move, I move, right? These were epic contests where my ultimate and seemingly unattainable goal was victory over my master, my grandpa. Again, you're starting to see his personality. He calls his grandpa a master. In college, I have found my, many friends who are happy to play, and I have been able to improve. Just last year, I finally defeated grandpa in an even contest. Through chess, I learned the value of planning ahead and competing in a time environment, right? He doesn't overstretch it. It's chess, right? It, it, it has taught him lessons. It has got him closer to his grandpa, but it hasn't showed him that he wants to be a doctor or save lives or anything like that that's that's just different and this is just a part of him that he wants to share with medical schools and I just love again the details they're so inviting right a single story gives you insight into who the author is he feels warm he feels friendly he feels humble he feels like a guy that happily goes home during thanksgiving break to play chess with grandpa during uh the holiday dinner those are just fantastic details. Okay, here we go. Another double star where we talk about the children camp. Okay, so I greatly benefited from being guided and encouraged by supportive mentors. Countless students are not as fortunate as I am, and this motivated me to join this camp. Our mission is to mentor students from underserved areas of Los Angeles who are interested in medical careers. We do this by hosting these students for three spring days uh, at a comfortable campsite, complete with cabins and meeting halls, and introduce them to professionals who represent a variety of medical careers. I first joined as a counselor in 2016. I fundraised for a family of five, and then I served as my family's counselor. Fantastic. So by the end of the camp, I found myself acting as their mentor, explaining college application, fill out the FAFSA, SAT study strategies. I mentored them for the ensuing two years. I'm happy that all five are now in college. A fantastic detail. Seeking more responsibility, I became a member of the camp board, recruiting speakers and mentors and scheduling all the events. I learned how to gain the attention and commitment of very busy people, as well as the importance of flexibility, improv, and contingency planning. This year at 2 a.m., a PhD who was slotted to present at 8 a.m. emailed me that his presentation was not ready and he could not participate. Like my heart just sunk. We're just reading that. I don't even know why he was awake to get that email, but he gets this email. PhD cannot participate. And now as the executive board of the camp, he's in hot water, right? He, he, he's in trouble. Fortunately, a camp alumna who's now a medical student was able to come in the mornings. We had a presenter in place of our missing PhD. I spent the rest of the day reaching out to numerous professionals and found a pharmacist who agreed to give a presentation about his career path and the time slot originally meant for the medical student. All has happened behind the scenes. No one noticed and the camp went off smoothly. I was, a, I was elected as the director of camp for next year, and I'll do my best to inspire a new group of students and mentors, right? A lot of really cool things. And this is like when people talk about extracurriculars and impressive things for medical schools, the first thing that doesn't often come up is camp for children, right? But I just love this progression that he demonstrates. Number one, I myself had great mentors. Number two, I fundraised so others could have great mentors like me. Number three, I tried my hand at being a mentor. And then four, I became director of camp after handling this hullabaloo very well. Um, I just love how the story is so inviting, brings you on to him needing mentors, then becoming a mentor, and then becoming the director of mentors. It's just, it's like this nice little flip book of a person going from baby to teenager to adult to middle-aged career to a wise old old man, right? You really start to see the development right before your eyes. A couple other details. I like how he writes, I learned how to gain the attention and commitment of very busy people. That's not something a lot of us think about until we're doing something like this, right? Most of us in our day-to-day -day lives don't have the problem of getting attention and commitment from very busy people. But as a camp director who's putting on talks and presentations, you absolutely will. So I love that detail and it's very inviting. Number two, it's really awesome to just see him describe flexibility and problem solving 
in a simple way without ever saying those words, right? It talks about the 2 a.m. PhD and rearranging the schedule and finding someone else, a pharmacist to slot in and have that discussion instead of the PhD. He never says he's flexible. He never says he's a good problem solver. He never says he's creative. He never says he's determined, but you know that about him after him sharing this story. And lastly, the, the details that just really bring you into the experience, right? You getting the email at 2 a.m., oh no, like six hours, how am I supposed to find a presenter? And him probably staying up all night trying to figure out who is going to present instead of this PhD. These, you're starting to, to know the person and know the man who's writing all this. And so when he describes the situation, when he's stuck at 2 a.m. and needs to think on the fly, you're, you're like rooting for him on the sideline. At least I am. I was hoping that this had a very positive outcome. And I'm glad it did off the back of his hard work. And I could only feel that way because of all these details he shares. Okay. And we have another one with I Am Flag Football here. One of my favorite hobbies is I Am Flag Football. I prefer team sports. And football is the ultimate team sport. No single player can ever claim credit for a win or a loss. My teams have varied over the years from friends and classes to clubs and work. And I've played every position in the field, even quarterback. <laughs> Again, just a personality. Like I've played every position, even quarterback. Uh, my teams have tasted the sweet glory of victory. Again, a very casual phrase. He's, he's a very fun guy. A high point would have been to be the championship victory against the club rugby team. Very, very impressive. And the bitter devastation of defeat. A blowout loss to the men's cheerleading squad. Yeah, like, just like these sentences are just kind of comical, right? It's very casual and still a professional way, but still ca it has a hint of casualness. You start to really feel like, oh, this guy would be a cool guy to hang out with. He's probably a fun guy, cracks a lot of jokes. Um, and you get that in his writing. Even quarterback I've played. I've tasted the sweet glory of victory. I remember when we won against the club, club rugby team. What a great win for our squad. And oh my God, I remember how bad it hurt to lose in a blowout to the men's cheerleading squad. I mean, not that like men who cheerlead are bad at football. Clearly not. But I just think that the contrast is kind of hilarious and the imagery is so inviting. Among the highs and lows of sports competition, I learned not only to be a loving teammate, but also a good sport, humble in victory and gracious in defeat. Like it, I just felt this phrase, a blowout to the men's cheerleading squad, I just put here skull emoji because it, it just feels like that. It feels like that's how he's writing to me. Um, and again, the details just really bring that out. Okay. So those, oh, and then we'll get through his personal statement, which will share some of these fantastic imageries. Uh, I think we can just do that now because it's a huge part of this first conclusion. Okay, so let's dive into this fantastic personal statement. My nine year football playing career ended in an emergency room after the second game of my second year in high school when a doctor showed me the x-ray of my mangled right hand. He explained that if I re-injured it, I would require surgery and risk losing some function in my hand. Recovery was to be longer than the remaining season. The reality of no longer being a part of my team was more painful than the injury. I was not ready to give up involvement in the sport, however, so I became an equipment manager for the uh, college football program. One of the players was from my hometown, and we formed a close relationship. That's awesome, right? I was awed by his commitment to become a professional football player, but his dreams were crushed after he suffered multiple concussions during his junior year. His injuries were exacerbated by the undiagnosed concussions in his youth. To save what was left of his health, he had to give up his dream. I knew exactly how he felt, right? Yeah. This is just such a universal, it, it's so universally relatable, like, not all of us has had uh, aspirations to be professional athletes, but all of us have had these big dreams that have been shut down for one reason or another. And all of us have had people that we're close to have big dreams that have been shut down for one reason or another. And to see him describe this in just one paragraph where he's a nine-year-old who wants to play back to, he's a nine year football career just ending in an emergency room, like a very sterile place, right? 
in an ambulance bay with loud noises and people sitting in the hallway, right? To, to lose your, your dream and your career there is, is difficult. And then to continue in college, have a close friend who really is so close to making it, and his dreams get crushed. I mean, you really feel for the guy, right? You can feel his hurt by what could have been. It's gone. My friend's adversity inspired me to join the mission to understand, diagnose, and prevent concussions. Brain Sport Program is a group of physicians and scientists who research sports-related brain injuries. These are the same providers who helped my friend make his difficult choice to end his football career. Like, that's difficult, right? It's easy for someone to hate these people, the, the doctors and scientists who say, you will not play football again, or you should not play football again. Um, but it's also... It takes a level of maturity to say, no, these people are looking out for my health, and that is the larger thing here, even though my dream feels like it's everything, right? A lot of football players dream for the professional level of competition or the amount of uh, income that they make that changes a generation of family and multiple generations after, right? Those are big things to give up. Uh, and really, it takes something equally as strong, if not stronger, your health to really be able to give that up. Again, these details, right, are the ones that are really just inviting you into the story. Their comprehensive study of the team includes helmet installed sensors, measures of magnitude, location, direction, duration of each collision. The data, paired with advanced neuroimaging and standard multimodal clinical tests, help doctors increase their understanding of concussions and search for the mechanism of injury. Preliminary data from sensors suggests that a hit following a string of smaller impacts is more likely to cause a concussion than an isolated impact. Research promises to help find the means to prevent injuries like the one suffered by my friend. This led me to devote myself to running the daily operation of the impact measurement system in addition to equipment manager duties. I now ensure that accelerometers fit comfortably in the helmets so that players actually wear them, right? and transmit the data to the research team after each practice and game. I administer test batteries to players and assist with research tests, including MRI and transcranial Doppler, or Dopplers of the head. Because of this experience, evidence-based medicine, medicine, medicine became my passion. This is one of my favorite paragraphs, right? He, he shows a great understanding of the research, uh, uh, great understanding of research proper and, and more specifically of football players, right? He understands football players. He knows that if they're going to participate in this research, their helmets still have to be comfortable. And there are probably these huge bulky sensors that are in there. And so he's testing them out. He's using his hat of uh, when I was a football player, like would this have been comfortable to me? And he's adjusting it so that people actually wear them. And I also love the, the, uh, the how he says that evidence-based medicine became my passion. I guarantee you the next... 10 personal statements that you read, there's going to be some semblance of this cliche. I am passionate about evidence-based medicine. I am passionate about research informing medicine. This was something I wrote in my own personal statement and my own working activities. But I just love how he got here. Like this really lands, right? I love how he finds his career or his corner of medicine. Even him, like this dude who's your traditional stereotype jock, the dude that loves football can connect to the same world of evidence-based medicine, just like people like stem cell therapists, just like immunotherapy oncologists, just like all these fancy basic science, oncology, blood, lung, heart, liver researchers. This is a guy who loved football, had a guy whose professional career ends because of concussions, and he starts to love the imaging, the MRI, the transcranial Dopplers, the research and the accelerometers. And bringing his love for football to medicine, uh, this, all that and all those details make this conclusion, this cliche, really, really hit home. You'll read other personal statements, undoubtedly, where they say this, and it just doesn't land the same, right? Because there's no buildup. There's no proper storyline that makes sense. There are no pieces of evidence, of data. There's no stories that support it. And because he has that story, this, I, I have full confidence and I believe this when he says it. My interest in medicine led me to volunteer at the emergency room. 
Ironically, it's the same ER where my football career ended. Like he has these beautiful, like circular motifs that come again and again into his writing. I interact with countless patients and having been a patient there myself, I felt a kinship with them, right? It just feels very genuine and warm and authentic. One patient who stands out in my memory was a young boy who was brought to the ER by his parents. I will call him Charlie. He was drenched in sweat, his lips were pale, and he was complaining about dizziness. A nurse drew a sample of his blood and he was terrified by the needle. I brought Charlie a teddy bear, sat with him, talked to him, tried to calm him down for several minutes. Found out that he was in kindergarten, he's a little boy. His favorite superhero was Spider-Man and that his favorite game was Trouble. I don't even know this game of Trouble, but it sounds fun. Talking to me seemed to distract him, and so I stayed at his bedside with his parents. Like, I even just like how he phrases this. He seems just like a very humble guy. He doesn't say, um, I knew I was, uh, I, my excellent conversational skills were distracting him, or uh, something like hero heroic, like, I was able to separate Charlie from the uh, world of pain of medicine, right? It's not something heroic. He uses the passive voice, and he uses this, like, cautious word seemed talking to me seemed to distract him i'm not sure but it seemed to be and so i stayed at his bedside with his parents when the doctor arrived she explained that the boy was hypoglycemic and uh hypoglycemic so low sugar and that we were going to help him her use of the word we made me feel like an important part of her team right he's all he's he's deferring decision making and he's deferring like who is actually helping this child to other people of authority. He's saying that the doctor said that we, including him, was an important part of the team. And he plays well with this guy's personality of being genuine and humble and authentic because he's not saying I was an important part of her team. He's saying we were, right? And he's not saying we because he believes it. He's saying that the doctor said that we and that made me feel good. It, it just is so deferential. It's so respectful. And I'm really loving how his personality comes out in his writing. More blood samples were drawn, an IV was hung, and the patient's symptoms soon began to improve. Playing my small part, again, small part, being very deferential again, to support Charlie through this stressful experience while observing the doctor provide diagnosis, treatment, exposing art and science of medicine, being thought of as a member of the team was inspiring and made me want to do more. Again, another cliche, but I really feel that it hits home because I, I really like reading about this guy. Like I really want to know more about how genuine he is. And I'm, I'm just reading it, or I wrote it here when I uh, annotated it for the first time. The dude is just seriously exuding genuine positive energy off the page, right? Being thought of as a member of the team was inspiring and just made me want to do more. That's in contrast to other pre-meds who put themselves at the center of the story and say like uh, other patients were blessed because he was, because I was in the room or something like this, right? I just, I love this deference. Last summer I became a certified EMT. In addition to my other activities, I now work two overnight shifts for a company. Most of my patients need to be brought in by gurney and lifted to the ambulance, which cannot be done alone without coordination and teamwork. After the patient is safely inside the ambulance, one of us drives while the other stays in the back to render care. I prefer to stay in the back, take history, monitor vitals, provide oxygen, and make sure the patient is safe. Most suffer from pain, and I try to relieve their suffering as much as I can by talking to them and holding their hands as the ambulance speeds through our sleeping city. Another kind of beautiful image. I always wonder what happens to them after they arrive at the hospital, what treatments they receive, and if they ever get better, right? This is a recurring motif. We remember when he dropped off that elderly lady at the hospice facility, and this is that recurring motif again. After, although I enjoy being an EMT, my goal is to become a physician, and it just hits, right? It makes sense. This is a reflective, genuine dude who just like, man, I wonder if they got better. I wish I was more part of their care. Having been a patient and a caregiver, I learned that doctors are team leaders who dedicate their lives to serving the communities one patient at a time. I will attend medical school because I crave training and knowledge to help people like Charlie and to become a leader of a team of medical professionals. I dream about lifelong learning to solve problems like my friend's brain injury also hits hard and to be able to express my love of human beings. Like, look at this phrase, to be able to express my love of human beings. <laughs> you can tell this guy really loves human beings, right? The way he describes Charlie, the way he describes the pain he feels when he's lifting that old grandma, 
uh, whose chemo has been stopped and she's end of life. Like, you can tell this guy loves human beings. The pain he feels when he loses his professional career and his friend's professional career. And my love of science by serving my community one patient at a time. All right. I love these details here. I annotated this. It feels like the back of the ambulance is our own living room. Like I feel like just, I, I can see the living room. I can see, if I close my eyes, I can see the ambulance. Again, the red and blue sirens on top. I think that might be police, but just the red sirens on top, red and white maybe. And this guy is in the back of the ambulance. The patient's on the gurney. He's talking to this patient. He's giving him oxygen. He's holding their hand, telling them that we're just a couple minutes away, that everything will be okay, that we'll take good care of them, right? That stuff, like I can, I can picture all that just from this writing, right? Holding their hands as the ambulance speeds through our sleeping city, right? He's working the overnight shift. It's dark outside. Someone needs his help and he's able to support them. Right. This personal statement is a fantastic, it's honestly one of my favorites as well. It, it just is it, so inviting. It's so raw. It's so uncut. It's so genuine. You just start to learn so much about different parts of society that you're not privy to. I'm not privy to the back of an ambulance, but I feel like I know more because of what I read. I'm not privy to what it's like to want a professional career in sports and have that taken away from you. But I feel like I understand the pain because of how he writes about it. If there's anything that you can take away, if you're writing your application or if you're before writing your application, invite people to these pockets of life that you've experienced, that you're the expert on, because these windows into what you experience, is, they're, they're just some of the most impactful things that you could ever share with someone. This is the journey, this is your narrative, this is your story, and these are the details that really just bring it all together and make medical schools want to get to know you more. All right, fantastic. Let us move on to points number two. You, your story, and your personality is all we ever really want to know about. It's not your publications or your volunteer work, it's you. Let's go through some of these examples in green. Uh, we've started to feel this kind of energy, or at least I have, uh, that I want this guy to succeed. I want to meet this guy. I want to understand just his perspective on life, why he loves people so much. Um, and we'll start to see more examples of his personality in these green stars right here. So we talked about this ambulance activity here, but a couple of things to highlight with his personality. Um, him holding her hand him sharing the thoughts of that patient and her family suffering, his emotional well-being and the ability to self-care as being important as a provider. You start to get this like very caring energy from this guy, like very warm, caring, big brother, uh, like protective father, those types of energies, um, or, or just like a, a caring friend is what I get from these um, examples. Emergency room volunteer, this is one that we haven't gone through. Here we go. For the past 12 months, I've been a volunteer in the emergency room at Blank Hospital. My job is to make patients and their, and their families as comfortable as possible. I just love this description, right? How many pre-meds would scoff at this, this description? If you had a job description for a hospital volunteer position and it all said, the only thing it said is, your job is to make patients and their family as, as comfortable as possible, I guarantee you no one would apply to that because pre are like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. I want to go to rounds. I want to shadow doctors. I want to do procedures, right? But he takes pride in this description, and you can really just start to see his personality. He's the type of guy to take pride in that job. And I wrote here, a simple, humbling description most pre would scoff at. I deliver warm blankets. I make the beds. I clean up messes, and I bring donated teddy bears to pediatric patients who are often scared and crying, right? It's just the stark contrast of, or it's just the, it's just the level of pride he takes with what he is doing, right? 
I wrote here, there's a sense of pride he writes with. He doesn't hide behind fancy writing. He keeps it simple. I tell you exactly what I do. Over 300 hours I have spent donating or delivering blankets, making beds, cleaning up messes that other people made, and then bringing donated teddy bears. That is a sense of humility that we all want in our medical provider. The guy that will take off your sock to inspect your inspect your foot pain and not make a comment about how nasty it is to touch someone's foot or sock, right? The doctor who will hold your hand and spend time with you and sit with you when he or she doesn't have an answer for your question or, or an answer for your disease, right? You, th that person starts here, right? That person starts delivering warm blankets, making the beds, and taking pride in that. I also get to see doctors interact with patients and staff, witness minor procedures, and learn the importance of medical record keeping. You can see, like, this is your traditional pre-med description of hospital volunteering. I see doctors interact, I witness procedures, I do a little bit of shadowing, and then I learn medical record keeping, right? You can see how stark the contrast is of how, like, stale and sterile that is compared to the love and warmth that is here, the warm blankets, the making the beds, things of that sort. This experience taught me the art of talking to sick patients and enabled me to form relationships with medical professionals. Now, whenever I come up, uh, pick up or drop off a patient at this hospital as an EMT, it feels as if I am visiting home, right? This is the ED where they told him he would never play football again. This is the ED he volunteers at. This is the ED that he picks up patients like the woman that needs to go to her hospice facility and drops off patients. Uh, like the sick patient he picked up that needs oxygen. He's taking history in the back of the van while his uh, partner is driving to this hospital. This, this man has matured within this community and its hospital. And so when he says, it feels as if I am visiting home, I, I just love it because I love seeing him through multiple stages of life in this place in this hospital. It just hits well. All right, so that's a great explanation or a great example of his personality and him coming across as a very warm, caring gentleman. All right, next here we have the Brain Sport Undergraduate Club. In researching the science behind brain injuries, brain sport program doctors perform baseline testing for every athlete. It's a very large task and to assist them, another team manager and I, together with a handful of friends, right? Like, I love that he calls them friends. Like he even calls his club colleagues friends. Just for some context, this club was founded. They probably got volunteers to sign up at a community, at a, uh, like, a enormous activities fair. And he calls them friends, not colleagues or club mates or things like that. He just calls them friends. Founded the Brain Sport Undergrad Research Division Club. Since its founding two years ago, our club has grown from five members to more than 30 our responsibilities also grew from helping with baseline testing to assisting with data entry and community outreach. I've learned how to recruit new members, observe brain sport doctors, present information about concussion protocol to schools and administrators in the community. It's just super on brand and genuine for this guy. Um, handful of friends. That's what I want to remark on and emphasize. And then I just love the data here. Our club has grown from five members to more than 30 over two years. There's just some data to support the growth of his club. Okay, so when he says, I have learned how to recruit new members, you have data that says, yeah, he recruited 25 total people. All right, so let's talk about this activity now, his clinical laboratory activity. To make sure that medicine was the right path for me, I sought out a summer job in the medical field immediately after freshman year. There are few more humbling experiences than working as a specimen unbagger at a medical laboratory. Just for context, a specimen can be anything from blood to urine to feces to abdominal fluid to lung fluid. There's a ton of bodily fluids to saliva, right? Those can be all specimens to pathologic specimens or uh, like uh, pathology surgical specimens like masses that were resected or 
pieces of like autopsy material and a medical laboratory. This job requires not only commitment to detail, but a strong stomach too, right? It talks about the different sights and smells and textures of all these specimens. Working at a pathology laboratory, I learned about the work of certified lab assistants who remain mostly invisible as they perform incredible important services for numerous doctor's office clinics and hospitals in LA. I love it, right? He is giving, he's like tipping his hat. He's saying thank you to the lab assistants who no one ever talks about, but does incredible work for medicine, right? It's again, it's just super on brand for this guy to be so respectful, so deferential to these people. Initially, I was given little responsibility. Again, he's so proud of that, right? I was given little responsibility. He's honest. That's the tr that's his truth, and he's not shying away from it. And my job consisted of opening the specimen containers and racking samples for testing, right? Some of the things I annotated, there's just a hint of casualness that gives a window into his personality. Uh, you need a strong stomach, or you need the, the people who remain mostly invisible as they perform incredibly important services you, you only know that when you work with these people that you've never seen before, uh, and still he, he pays the respects that are due. And you get both of those bits of personality from those phrases. And lastly, this part that he admits he was given little responsibility. He was just tasked with opening things and racking them. And he's proud of that, right? One skill I learned at the lab is to be aware of my surroundings and to move smoothly and deliberately in order to prevent spills, okay? And to have a sense of humor about spills that cannot be prevented. Remember, this is like spills of urine and spills of stool and uh, feces and sp spills of blood, right? Not great things to spill, um, but it's just extremely on brand for him. It's like a lighthearted, friendly dude who has a sense of humor. Like, I could not have avoided that spill. There was an earthquake or something like that, right? Um, and... As my learning continued, I was given additional responsibilities. So as he's learning, he starts with little. And notice again, I annotated here, he doesn't have this outlandish commentary about saving lives, right? He knows that he has little responsibility. I open things and I rack them. I open things and I rack them. But as I learned, I was given more responsibilities. By the end of the summer, summer I was pulling samples, spinning them, removing clots, I learned how to aliquot samples, to run the machines, record the results. And when it was an emergency, I was trusted to push stat tests through the lab. The best part of this experience was gaining acceptance of my coworkers as a full member of their team. Again, don't you just like want to meet this guy, right? Like he is doing all this work, spills of urine on his shirt, feces on the floor, pulling samples, spinning them, removing clots, pushing stat tests. And he says the best thing about this job was when his coworkers accepted him. This is the same motif as when the emergency medicine doctor who was working with Charlie the kid said that we, because he was sitting with Charlie and doing the teddy bear talk with Charlie and playing trouble with Charlie, we were going to take care of Charlie. Right? You get a person who, who seems like really, really grateful that he's included and he belongs in a setting. And I just love that personality trait that is uh, it's just really showing and apparent on his writing. As the summer ended and I prepared to leave the lab, many of them wanted me to stay and keep my job. I was tempted to stay because of the great camaraderie I sh shared with them. The leader of this lab, Dr. Blank, um, Department of Pathology, he became one of my treasured mentors in the past several years, and he guided me to volunteer the ED uh, to become an EMT, experiences well beyond, beyond what the lab could have given me. I learned a lot, but my most valuable gain from the summer was Dr. Blank's mentorship. Again, so differential, right? He could have stayed, but he admits that he learned so much from his mentorship to become an ER volunteer, to become an EMT, uh, that he, again, tips his hat to this professor of pathology and lab medicine. This is an example where he doesn't need to ever say that he's a great team member, right? You know he's a great team member. He doesn't say teamwork at all on the entire application, but you can feel and believe he absolutely is an asset to his football team, to his co-working team, to his EMT company, to the clubs that he's a part, in, part of. Um, you just, 
really enjoy reading about the guy and reading about what he's done with the team members that he's been involved with. The, the, the camp for children, right? All that stuff. Okay, now we have an, uh, an activity here, homeless outreach. On Tuesday nights, together with other students from different religious organizations, I serve dinner to the homeless uh, at this church. We provide hot lentils, fruit, water, other necessities. We stand on the prosperous corner of blank, handing out food and talking with people who are in dire need. Many of the population we serve are former vets who are simply passing on their way to their next destination. Again, there's like this nice casualness about them. They're just simply passing through on their way. Many are regulars. This experience, and you can see how that contrasts and that's heavier, right? Many are simply passing through on their way to their next destination. There's a lightness to that. And then he smacks you with, but many are regulars. Remember, regular to this homeless volunteer serving dinner. Like they regularly need help, right? This experience taught me how to talk to people who are down on their luck. Again, casualness. And how to comfort them with simple acts and words to see the people who our society does not want to see. We have another recurring motif, this motif of the invisible man or the invisible lab assistant or the invisible homeless person and how he's shining a light and saying, you deserve to be seen too. And you deserve to be respected and loved and cared for too. And so when he says he has a passion for loving other human beings, you start to see real evidence of where that's coming from, right? There's a casualness that comes with this author and how he sees life that's just really refreshing. It's really enjoyable to see. Okay, so I think those are all the green asterisks. That is point number two here. Um, you just really wanna root for the guy, right? Personality, warmth, caring, love for people, right? These motifs, uh, uh, respect, humility, deference. He doesn't really say any of those things ever, but you start to really feel that way about this guy. Um, and I'm grateful that I know the guy in person. He, he is exactly every one of those things and more. So the, the takeaway here is think actively about how you want to come across. What energy do you want your readers to leave with? What energy, what words do you want them to remember, remember you by? I want you to write those things down, whether you're a freshman or a senior about to apply to medical school, um, whether you're taking your first or second gap year, whether you're a high schooler, right? Like what do you want to be known as? What words do you want to describe you? Write them down and you'll start to see that you'll want to be more consistent with those values and you'll start to see where some of the things that you do are consistent with those values and you'll highlight those. You'll do more of those things. And some of the things that you do, the, the jokes that you make at other people's expenses or the activities that you do or, that are a little contrary to your values, you'll start pulling away from those because you'll recognize that that is a vote against the person that you want to be. All right. Lastly, number three, competing in your own lane automatically makes you world class. I, I talked about this already, um, so I'm not going to, there's no real examples to demonstrate, but you can see with the activities overall that this person is involved with, he's competing in his own lane, right? His EMT interest, we'll talk about that in a bit, but emergency room volunteer um, comes off the back of him going to the emergency room, telling his football career is ending him volunteering the emergency room, him becoming an EMT, right? All these things are in his ecosystem. You can see how this guy really grows up with the emergency room in his backyard. Um, the brain sport program, his experience with football and being an equipment manager at UCLA, I think we can actually go and, dis and talk about that. Uh, but that would be a nice little addition to understand kind of where he's coming from and why he's the perfect person for that type of research activity. So equipment manager for 1800 hours over three years. As a football equipment manager for college, I organize practice drills with coaches, managers, and maintain the team's equipment from uniforms, shoulder pads, and helmets. My responsibilities include emergency sideline equipment repair, replacement, managing the software, I've met countless interesting and famous people through this activity and learned what it means to have a professional bearing. Right? You get this kind of like, yes sir, no sir type of energy. Everything that we do as a team of managers affects the team and the way that the public sees them in person and on TV. So it is of utmost importance that we do our jobs, making the team look perfect. Again, 
he he never says he's like a great team member. He never says everyone wants him on his team. But you can see this like larger conscientiousness, this like understanding of the bigger picture and the mission and the duty of of a Division One high profile football team that he's a part of. Right? He meets these famous athletes uh, and famous coaches, and he knows that his team's on TV, and he recognizes. His job is to maintain the equipment, and his job is to make sure that they look good as a, t- as a team on TV. They look good, and they're prepared when they're in their competitions. It- it's like how every member of the team, from the head coach to the manager to the players to the equipment managers to the janitors that clean the weight room like everyone is so aligned on what the overarching goal is and i get that sense from how he describes his role as an equipment manager he doesn't blow it up over the top and say like my job cleaning the helmets or the sole reason that we win every single game he's not really painting himself as a hero of the the entire ordeal and the operation he's deferential he knows his role he does it well and there's kind of a respectable air when you're reading that. And so all those things in context and together, just, again, make him the perfect person for these research activities, specifically with concussions and MRIs of the head and head ultrasounds. His interest in football, concussions, emergency care, all of these make him perfect for this and not perfect for aquatic crop cultivation research or epigenetics and stem cell research or skincare research or RNA virus and molecular modeling research. All of these research that other pre-meds will uh, take to because they're publicly available and you can apply, um, but it, it's not in his lane. It's not a place where he's world class and can aut- and automatically outcompete every single other pre-med there. So I recommend everyone try to figure out like where do you want your lane to be. Uh, it's okay if you don't want to study breast cancer and leukemia for children. It's o- it's okay if you don't want to study immunotherapy and all these other fancy CRISPR Cas9 stuff. That's okay. You just need to be honest with what you care about, and when you figure that out you'll find that other people care about that stuff too. And the harmony of you guys working together to develop these really strong, cool projects is just more beneficial from, for, for your pre-med application uh, and your career development overall. Okay, so those are the three big conclusions for this application breakdown. Let's start from the top here to see if there's any other kind of activities that I wanna remark on. So this is just Honors College. Uh, it looks like I didn't really write too much here, so nothing to write home about. Um, Honors Seminar, okay. So the Honors Seminar in, in Los Angeles is a group of dedicated learners, consists mostly of retired professionals uh, who discuss an interesting topic in history, science, or literature. I enrolled in a seminar studying General Douglas MacArthur. Learning about American history is fascinating, but the real seminar value was fostering relationships with these members. It showed me the potential of having a life full of learning and offer valuable advice about academics and relationships. Next fall, I shall return and can reconnect with my friends. Okay, so you get kind of a sense of what this guy does outside of class, right? He goes to these seminars and probably some I don't know, cafe in the city on, on Saturday mornings, and they talk about General Douglas MacArthur, uh, and it's a bunch of retired professionals who want to pass on their wisdom. Okay, cool. So there's just a little bit more context. I don't think there's much more of that. Emergency volunteer, we'll talk about this Wikipedia publication. So an assignment in biochemistry honor seminar was to find and complete an unfinished Wikipedia page related to biochemistry. I found a stub about nicotinamide, a form of vitamin B3 found in food, uh, mammal metabolism, researching the article, electron transport chain, nicotinamide moiety, picks up a hydride atom. Okay, okay, science, science, science. I rewrote the chemistry and biochemistry portion and updated the introduction. I hope my work is helpful to biochemistry students around the world. Yeah, I, I love this, right? It's just simple. It's 50 hours. It's part of a class. And he doesn't talk it up any more than it needs to be talked up. He says, I found an article, it was part of a class, I rewrote the introduction, and it's all about this vitamin that is in food. That's it. And I hope that my work is helpful to biochemistry students around the world. 
And it's okay that not every activity for you is 1,200 hours and has two publications and saved a life, right? It's okay that it's just like a very straightforward thing that you're proud that you partook in and that's it. I wrote here that he doesn't need to do any, uh, any more than what he did. He didn't play anything up. He didn't over inflate it. He didn't stretch it at all. And I encourage you, if you're gonna add something that is of kind of this tier that you like but not love, I encourage you please to not try to connect everything to medicine. Please don't try to make it sound much more uh, life-changing than it was. It's okay if, if you just liked it. Okay, um, conversely, if you loved it, I really want to see you kind of delve into it and really share that love with the reader. Um, but if you didn't, that's okay too. Uh, we talked about chess, we talked about brain sport, we talked about the children's camp, talked about um, the undergraduate brain sport club, and then the clinical laboratory, homeless research, or homeless outreach, and then I am flag football. And then lastly, we have, uh, uh, we talked about the equipment manager. This last activity we have is crew. Crew is a Christian organization that encourages members to grow closer to Jesus and dive del deeper into biblical scripture. Group has taught me the value of stable relationships and um, helped me de develop a worldview, discuss some of life's biggest questions. I've come to admire the way Jesus approached relationships, continually putting others before himself and honoring people who are looked down upon and outcast from society. Uh, he reaches out to the broken, welcomes them into his family. I, through homeless outreach, have tried to follow Jesus by showing love to people who are looked down upon and cast out. See, this is like a very classic um, pre-med cliche. The, the thought of like wanting to put others before themselves and honoring people who are looked down upon and outcast from society. However, I, I love his approach to it because there's other examples in his application that make it very clear that he really believes this, right? There's the homeless outreach that he talks about in detail. There are the invisible lab scientists that he tips his hat to and says, thank you so much for doing all this hard work to make medicine run. Uh, no one really recognizes your work because you're behind the scenes, but I recognize your work and I am very grateful for the time I got to spend with you, right? There's a level of deference there that sounds very much like what he's saying here, continually putting others before himself and honoring people who are looked down upon and outcast from society. He has a story where the doctor in the emergency room with Charlie invites him to be part of the medical team and says like, we are taking care of Charlie and that makes him feel good. That makes him feel like he's part of something larger. There is the deference where he says, I'm the equipment manager. What I do is I make sure the equipment is pristine so that when they're on TV, they can perform at their best. They can have this public image. And, and he's not the star of the show, and he's okay with that. There's the example of when he's the lab clinical assistant. He says, I started with very simple uh, responsibilities. I opened and I racked. I opened and I racked. And I opened and I racked. And as I grew... Um, and learned a little bit more about the roles, I started doing more unclotting things, aliquotting things, all this other stat lab tests, pushing them through. But he says even in that activity that the most impactful thing for him was being a member of the team and being accepted by his coworkers. And so when he writes this cliche, continually putting others before himself and honoring people who are looked down upon and outcast from society, I have tried to follow Jesus by showing love to people who are looked down upon and cast out. I believe him, right? It's hard to deny this man's like warmth and his good nature because the entire personality is just riddled with examples of that, right? It's riddled with the funny I am flag football, um, bitter devastation of defeat when I lost to the men's cheerleading squad, right? It's just littered with all these yes sir, no sir, positive warmth types of energy. And so when he writes this, it just lands very well. And I encourage you to, when you think about your story or your application, just make sure that what you're writing, just it's on brand, right? It's thematically consistent. It is who you are. And what it feels like on paper is like who you are as a person. And, and what that means is like reflecting your values in life will inevitably reflect what you have on paper. And if you try to emulate a person on paper that you are not in real life, that becomes a little bit of a stretch. It becomes harder to believe. And there's these details and these phrases that are missing that just overall don't give you that warmth and that genuine, authentic kind of vibe and feeling that he's showing here. 
Okay, so that is this fantastic application. Again, a gap year. I mean, zero gap years, 3.7 GPA, 512 MCAT, gets into a strong top 50 medical school with um, no gap year, which is very difficult to do uh, back in 2019 when he did it, but also as we go on and medical school becomes more and more competitive, still increasingly difficult. This is a strong application with a guy with a strong personality, uh, and I hope you guys learned something from it. Thank you for listening. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye. I love how this pre-med took advantage of his time and opportunities at UCLA and competed in his own lane to stand out from the literal thousands of other pre-meds who applied just from UCLA alone. And if you want to see how another UCLA pre-med stood out amongst the masses, you'll want to see this video here. You'll meet a 3.85 GPA, 514 MCAT student who ends up getting into one school in California and then another top 70 medical school in the nation. You'll see how he took advantage of his UCLA experience, but also recognized some key mistakes that made his application more generic than he wanted. If you come from a California under if you come from a California undergrad or really any big public school, you'll want to see this UCLA pre-meds application. I'll see you over there.